Hey y'all, it's Andrew Reed with Monster Creek Mushrooms. Um, and today, you see that you would join me on this nice, sweltering June day uh, out here by the water garden and in the backyard. It is nice enough to be out here working. And then I thought, well, you know, if I'm doing some of this stuff in the garden, I might as well share some of the results with you because this entire video is about using spent blocks. Um, and I have basically found another use for them. Uh, in part inspired by well, I, so I wondered it myself, and I looked it up, and I saw that William Padilla Brown of Apex Grower actually has already done some of this stuff. Uh, but it's growing uh, primarily insects off of your spent substrate. Um, basically just to process it faster um, and to provide other byproducts for you while growing. Um, real quick, though, before we get into that video, I have a couple of, of uh, updates. Old Road Oyster Mushroom was cloned in December and I have that I think on the uh, product description page and it's typically I was considering it a cool weather mushroom when you guys saw the update last time it was in the winter time and I had said something about the yields were a little low well we've been growing through the summer time and holy cow it's been doing really really well but not only that um, our friend Josiah up in Wisconsin has been well his are exploding like huge flushes <laughs> during the summertime and he's growing in a greenhouse so he's outdoors more so than me by a long shot and his are really producing he's like man i don't know what you're talking about this being a wintertime oyster a cool weather mushroom this is growing great in the hot weather so that's just an update for you guys i'm going to put that on our website um the other side of this is um we've been growing a new fairly new strain i think we've released it on the website because i had shown it on instagram but had not shown it on youtube yet uh, we have an oyster called devil's back and then we have another oyster called the devil's back up trail and the, the, all the devil's back up trail was it was found in the same little valley as the devil's back oyster right there along the devil's back rock formation in panther creek state park park but this one was found just a little bit up trail and we didn't have any other defining features uh, I'm got to come up with a new name for it, but this thing is the most tightly packed oyster I've ever seen them like like almost no stem all the time and it is just one cap Later on another later on another later on another for the densest clusters I've ever seen in fact I'll just pull that Instagram picture up and put it on here it will not fit so maybe I can put it right here You know somewhere, but uh, it is a beautiful oyster So I just want to let you guys know about those two things the old road is working in the hot weather and the Devil's Back Up Trail is the densest mushroom uh, as far as cap formation I have ever seen and uh, is a real winner in my opinion. So I just wanted to let you guys know about those two that are coming up. I'm trying to put more information on the website for those. And we'll have more oyster varieties that I'll be doing after the summer. Right now I'm just too busy to do too many trials. So um, so the other side of this is, I don't know why I'm still holding this pen. The, the, and it's not even the other side. The other part of this video See, I get, I get nervous in front of cameras even now, even when I'm by myself. Uh, and in full control of the editing, still, it's like a black hole, like a void where all my confidence goes. So, <laughs> that said, um, this video, like I, like I had said before, is more about like what we're going to do with spent blocks. So right now, I'm, we're selling our spent uh, blocks. We put them in our gardens, as you guys have seen. Um... I had told you all before about trying to grow black soldier fly larvae on that. More about that in a moment. Um, don't get too excited. It's not uh, anything to really to do with black soldier fly larvae. And um, trying to find other ways that we can use these spent blocks. So one of the things I was thinking about was that when you roll over a log in the woods, um, you have a lot of darkling beetles, just wild darkling beetles that you see out there. Mealworms and superworms are both the larval form of darkling beetles. So I wondered if you could, if they could subsist entirely off mushroom substrate. Well, when I looked it up, well, thankfully William Pitya Brown of Apex Grower had already done a little bit of, of work on this. Uh, I didn't see a lot, but some, and um, he had even talked about doing you know, that they eat styrofoam. So I got some styrofoam in a couple of the containers to to play with as well to see if they eat that. Um, I will say, I have fed, let's, let's just go into the first one, the super worms. I freaking love them. They have destroyed the substrate we added them to. They have a um, breeding cycle where you have to remove the, 
adult beetles and the pupa from the worms so that the beetles will not prey on the eggs and the worms, the little baby worms and such. Um, and we can do a whole breeding video on that if people are actually interested in that. But they do have a life cycle where you have to isolate them. So there's a little bit of work to super worms and that you need to isolate each worm so that it will pupate and then it will pupate uh, or then it will metamorphose uh, into a darkling beetle which will then you add into a container where they can reproduce together, lay eggs, you remove the beetles, they hatch out and so on. Man, I don't know if you guys can hear that fish, but man that fish is really they're trying to eat this plant next to me. Um, <clears throat> One of the things I was looking at with the the, lar the super worms, they will chew through substrate. And I mean, it is, you, you put substrate in a tank and then um, put substrate in a tank, put your, your super worms in there and they will burrow that stuff down and they, it leaves a nice layer of what's called frass, that's their droppings, um, which is really malleable, really fluffy. It's going to be good for garden soil. Um, the one thing I, and they, they just suck that stuff down. The one thing I don't like about the super worms so far is that they are very slow breeding compared to mealworms. Um, something like, they stay in the larva sta larval stage for about five months, they pupate for at least two weeks, if not more, and then they've got a two to, it's about two to four weeks um, before they start laying eggs, and then they'll live maybe another five months or so and you'll want to, they'll be laying eggs the whole time and you're going to want to remove the beetles every two to four weeks from those containers so then go so it's kind of a, a longish life cycle i mean it's almost a year right from being born going through the larval stage to uh the death of the adult um so pretty long lived and very productive and they produce a lot of frass um i will say that my best experience so far has been with mealworms um, they offer, they've got the, pretty much the same life cycle. Um, they're not as aggressive towards each other, so they can kind of be raised a little bit better together. You still want to remove the beetles and everything. Um, but beyond that, but beyond that, um, they have a much con more condensed life cycle down into weeks <clears throat> instead of months. And they really churn through the website, the, the not website, the substrate. And um, I've got some video that I can show you guys. They really eat that stuff down into nothing. And it's in no time. My mealworm colony, I'll show you guys, is about a quarter of the age of my superworm colony. I did get buy more mealworms, and I'll show you guys where to get those. I usually get them from Fluker uh, Farms. So you can just check that out. I swear I think they're waiting until I talk every yep. Uh, anyways. So another insect that we, we really tried to um <laughs> and the stocks are distracting me. My ADD is kicking in hardcore. Um, another insect that we tried was a couple of different types of roaches. Typically what are found in feeder insect um, farms for lizards and things like that. Um, we tried uh, Madagascar hissing cockroaches, just because I think they're fun. We used to have a colony of them for my boy. Um, they breed, they're, they're really slow, and they're really efficient. They have survived entirely and bred life cycle. You know, they've had broods of, of roaches on the substrate. But they are not, they do not eat it down very quickly. They are very efficient organisms. Um, which is not what we want, you know, like we don't want something that's so efficient that it doesn't need to eat our substrate. We want it to consume and eat a lot. So just to get rid of how much substrate we've got. Um, I found the same thing with dubia roaches. We tried dubias. They're a very common cockroach um, that people use for feeding, uh, primarily because they can't breed in your homes at like home temperatures or anything. Like you're not going to get an infestation of them. Um, again, efficient don't produce they don't really grow all that um they, they grow they grow okay fast like quickly they, they will grow the more heat you add the better they'll do but even at that they still just do not eat the substrate down i did the super worms before or no i did the super worm the roaches before i did my super worm colony and whenever i show you guys these you can see that there's a lot of substrate that's just not chewed up it's just not used they they loved it when i added them in 
they went and attacked it like it was like they had never had such a wonderful delightful food ever but they just don't consume enough to really make it practical I don't think um, the fourth one I've got I don't have as much experience with this personally but I will say that in our discord group we have a guy named Jesse, Jesse Campbell of Missing Meadows Mushrooms um, and he has used worm bins red wrigglers um, red wigglers yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's always a mouthful in the rhotic dialect. Um, red wigglers are... It's got to be wigglers. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm getting hung up. These little red worms are used for fishing. Um, I have them. I use them for kitchen scraps here at my house. But I have never used them for mushroom substrate. I've just always assumed that they would not work well. Um, Jesse told me that they did. He sent me some video of... He actually took a time lapse of mushrooms um, that you guys can check out on his channel. Of I think it's Missing Meadows Mushrooms. It may be just Jesse Campbell. Um, but he, ha he said that the top layer dried out real bad of the mushroom blocks, but underneath that was just the blackest, richest, darkest organic matter he's ever seen. Um, so I am replicating this experiment. I am building some bins. I am putting a drain in mine, which I think Jesse said he did not do his. Um, because I, the one thing I like about Red Wrigglers is that you get multiple products even compared to what you would with the insects. So let's say with the mealworms, you're getting a nice, nutritious, protein-rich food with the superworms too um, that you can feed to ducks and chickens and fish and who knows what else, a cordyceps. Uh, this, this was another direction I was going. Mushroom substrate to insects to Cordyceps militaris on insect-grown substrate um, so that you get all the free substrates you want uh, built into your system. But with the red wrigglers, you get uh, the protein-rich worms, which we know fish eat because we go fishing with worms. Uh, chickens and ducks love these worms. Um, <clears throat> I know this last video I said um entirely too much. I'm trying to stop. Um is the sound and dumb. Stop it. But, uh, but Red Wrigglers have a substance called worm wee that I get out of like my worm towers, which is why I put a drain in this. I use the worm wee. It's a dark, black, rich, sub, uh, like a liquid nutrient broth, basically. I put it in my fish tanks, my planted tanks. I put it in this water garden that I've got right here. Sometimes I splash it around on my, you know, like my tomato plants and at their roots and stuff. But a lot of times I just put it in my fish tanks so that my plants have a lot of mineral rich, you know, liquid being added. And I've got a couple of tanks that it turns the water really dark and then others where um, the duckweed and everything else grows so fast that it doesn't, you know, change the water color at all. Here I put it in my settling tank, which is just a, broke blue bucket where water gets piped in and then at the bottom of the bucket and then as the water fills up all the solids collect down at the bottom water comes out the top and goes spills into my water press bed which then goes into my what will eventually be my water spinach bed but right now it's just my water plant bed and then that cascades down into the fish tanks and then cycles back around um no no um <clears throat> the worm we replaces a lot of minerals that you're pulling out so if you eat out of your fish tanks like we do because we grow watercress we grow water celery we grow water spinach these are heavy feeding plants you need a way to add minerals back in worm wee is rich in water soluble minerals and worm castings which are that black dark substrate you'll see it it's it's really interesting because it's kind of like clay the way you can mold it it's not too wet not too dry and it makes plants go crazy uh, the tomato plants that we have out in the garden, the cucumbers, the tomatoes especially, we'll dig a hole down about this deep, plant a big wad of worm castings there at the bottom, and then put our tomato plant in stripped of leaves, cover it back up, and our tomato plants just go insane. So red wrigglers are probably my, maybe mealworms are my favorite, and then red wrigglers are my second favorite way of dealing with uh, biomass with uh, the spent mushroom substrate but I have got to do the experiment for the red wrigglers myself I will say apex grower again William Pedia Brown when I looked this up to see if other people have done it he was absolutely feeding the mushroom spent mushroom substrate to he was giving it to another guy who was feeding his worms with it and was having really good results 
And worms produce really fast. They re they can reproduce like every forty two days. Uh, so three worm, uh, two worms, can get together, produce the cocoons, which will hatch into about uh, into three worms in about twenty one days. And then I think after another twenty one days, those worms are now sexually mature. So every forty two days, you get a new generation capable of sexual mature, uh, sexual reproduction. And the entire adult life cycle, these worms are producing these cocoons, was it every one to three cocoons per week, this pair, and each one of those cocoons is producing three more worms, right? So you get this huge ramp up in population based on the available food and biomass in your worm bins. And what do we have more than almost anything as mushroom growers? It's biomass, plenty of biomass. And my thought is the mycelium breaks down lignin uh, containing because you don't you typically don't feed worms like wood chips, but we're doing straw and soy, and both of those are further are, are broken down by the oyster mycelium, chestnut mycelium, whatever, and the lignin is largely taken out of it, and a lot of the cellulose as well. So now these worms have a lot of carbohydrates that they have access to, especially after bacteria start to break it down, that they that they wouldn't have um, just coming across like a, a big piece of wood chip. So I think that we can kickstart this process. I almost said um, I don't know if you guys saw me swallow that um, but. but the uh, biomass that we're producing can be quickly, like we can ramp up with insects, feed this biomass to all of the insect populations, the worms, everything. And then from there, we have a further refined garden product, as well as oftentimes a protein rich substrate uh, or biomass that can go to uh, being a feeder for other organisms, such as fish or anything else. Or if you want to just end it right there and sell worms to people for fishing, or maybe you go supply bait shops. I don't know how you would monetize it yet, because I have not been monetizing it. But I will say that my gardens have been benefiting from the huge amount of biomass just from the mushroom farm, that where we just busted the blocks and throw them down. And we always get a lot of red wriggler worms. Um, and black soldier fly larva and all this stuff in them anyways and then samantha's roses just go insane My, our sun chokes go crazy our tomato plants everything just goes crazy with the large amount of organic matter that mushrooms are able to produce for us so now <clears throat> i do want to touch on the black soldier flies and the black soldier fly larva i have not messed with them much we get a lot of them just naturally they land in my worm bin some they they uh they are naturally occurring in all of my spent substrate piles. I still have not done any breeding experiments with them, mainly because they have the flying stage and you need to have a certain amount of heat available to them, which means that I don't know that I can comfortably do them all year like I can worms. Um, <clears throat> the, the worms, the mealworms, I'm comfortable I can do all year very easily. Black soldier fly larva, I am going to start playing with. We do have the netted cages to start putting the, uh, the the little pupa into so that they can hatch out and become the adults and then we'll put a little tray of substrate in where they can lay their eggs and then we'll get we'll switch that out pretty regularly and dump that in trays of more substrate and we will eventually try that and I will show those results but for now we know mealworms superworms can subsist entirely off mushroom substrate and so can red wriggler worms through uh, two or three different sources uh, and I will tr like I said I'll try that myself and if it fails miserably I'll definitely tell you guys and if it works then I will try to get around to doing a video pretty quickly of the update I, again what we tried the feeder roaches I wouldn't use those they for one thing I don't like roaches right that's the kind of icky factor for me the Madagascar ones are kind of cool because they hiss and they play you know they're they're kind of weird and they're kind of enough different uh, than other roaches that you can kind of get over it, but still, you're going to have a much smaller market. They're 
capacity to break down substrates is not as uh, robust as the red wriggler worms, the, uh, the mealworms, and the superworms. And I know the black soldier fly larvae are going to go gangbuster. We just got to figure out the breeding cycle of that. And I know people grow them in tropical areas, but here they're only ever grown in very seasonal conditions. And I don't want that because I produce mushrooms year round. With that, guys, I think that's pretty much all I've got for you today. It's not a real complicated video. It's pretty simple. We'll, I'll try to make sure to have some plenty of B-roll for you guys so you can see some of these setups that we've got. I am working on building a new worm bin. That So I'm taking my worms from over here at the house. I'm seeding this bin. I'll take it back over to the shop. And then we're going to start producing... We'll start busting up blocks pretty regularly and see how big can we take this in a small area and just produce more and more worms. Any excess we have, we'll just go to ducks and tilapia and, you know, who, uh, who knows what else we'll do. But if nothing else, we'll just dump them in our compost pile and let them go to work. The the results should be pretty interesting. So there, there are a few other organisms that we would like to trial. We're not there yet. Uh, obviously, we're, we're going to do what we can with what we've got. But eventually... Uh, I'm going to run out of space, so I have to be careful with how much space I'm taking up in experimentation, but that doesn't add direct value back, because it, first and foremost, it is a business, I need to make produce value, experimentation is fun, and I'm going to do plenty of it, but it's one of those things where I've just got to make sure I've got the room to do so safely. So, like I said, pretty simple video, hope this helps you guys, and uh, with that, y'all, remember keeps fun culture.